Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Renaud Deus. Um, I'm the president of the European University Institute, and in that capacity, it's a great pleasure for me to welcome such a large and distinguished audience to what promises to be a, a very uh, animated uh, workshop. Uh, I don't know. I know some of you are familiar with this institute. Uh, it's uh, it's a strange creature uh, in, in the sense that it, it is, as its name uh, aptly suggests, not a university properly speaking, it's an institution of higher education, um, but it's an institution of higher education that is distinguished by its European nature, genuinely transnational, and also by its ambition to deliver uh, a series of contributions that are in tune with discussions uh, underway at the European level and to bring together uh, the best of what uh, academia and uh, the world of public policy have uh, to offer. Uh, hence, uh, our interest in uh, exercises such as today's, it is important for us uh, to, uh, let's say, make sure that Despite the fact that, uh, courtesy of the Italian government, we are hosted in magnificent uh, buildings, we don't want to be locked in an ivory tower. And uh, we are therefore very grateful to guests such as you who come all the way to Florence, and we, we are well placed to know it's not always easy to get here, uh, to uh, discuss uh, with us on matters of common interest and the factors that, uh, of course, uh, uh, now that, according to uh, this uh, morning's news, there is perhaps, I will be very cautious, a possibility to uh, jump a hurdle, which, in, in fairness, we've been trying to jump uh, um, over a, a number of times already, uh, we should uh, return to issues which are central issues uh, in the life of any institution and uh, uh, in uh, the life of the European Union, namely to uh, its budgetary planning exercise. We know it's a difficult exercise. Uh, we know how uh, eminently political uh, this exercise is, but that's precisely what makes this interesting. I'm very uh, grateful to Alfredo uh, De Feo and uh, Brigitte Lafan for having put together such a nice program and a nice group of speakers. And I want to uh, uh, hope that you will uh, uh, leave uh, this meeting and the Institute with the feeling uh, that uh, you have been uh, in, uh, uh, let's say, given the opportunity to take part in an interesting event. I want, I also must apologize, but uh, uh, I was uh, talking to my neighbor about uh, the fact that uh, we do have a budget, uh, and it has to be submitted to our governing board uh, no later than tonight. <laughs> so for that reason, I will excuse myself and skip out of the room uh, when I will have finished. But please do not take this as a lack of interest in your work. Thanks again for uh, joining us, and I wish you an excellent conference. Good afternoon, everybody, and let, let me, first of all, thanks the organizer for inviting me, and secondly, congratulate the organizers for choosing such a timely uh, window which European issues are on the, on the front page. European issues are usually always on the front page, but this time uh, we are at the beginning of a new cycle which has been delayed for reasons to all of you are familiar with, and for such a encompassing topic, that is to say, the MFF, which is encompassing especially when it's time, like now, to identify challenges and allocate resources. It's budget time, as the President just mentioned, it's budget time for Italy as well. Unfortunately, I'm not involved directly in the budget formation this time, and this is the reason why I'm here. Although. Uh, 
I will have to apologize and uh, will have to leave right after the first panel uh, expires. Uh, well, I was delighted to learn that uh, I'm like colleagues, for each panel I'm a chair and a keynote speaker, which generates problems in uh, my personality because as a chair I would have to moderate a keynote speaker. Uh, and uh, as a keynote speaker, I would push for more time from the chair, but I'll try to, to find compromise. And since this is the first, I understand, this is the first panel uh, of, the, of the conference, and the conference is organized as giving more details to specific areas of analysis, uh, I will, I understood my assignment as providing an overview if that is possible, given the vastity of the argument, for what are the challenges facing the European Union and, of course, how that translates into challenges for the policy tools of which the MFF, of course, is a key one. So, uh, let me just begin with a list of challenges and uh, I will uh, offer some, nothing new, of course, but just to, to organize discussion and I will try to translate that into questions for all of us since there is no obvious answers to many of these issues at least in my view. Well first of all the challenges. Uh, there are many of them and one possible way is to organize challenges into three groups. Economics challenges, uh, if we look at how Europe is performing we should not be that happy. Uh, Europe and especially and including the Eurozone is slowing like the rest of the global economy. And uh, there is a strong suspicion that some of the reasons behind the slowdown are not cyclical but rather structural. If you look at Germany's situation, but not just Germany and not just the automotive sector, there is a uh, suspicion that there are structural challenges down the road. And some economists would also go as far as, as uh, suggesting that Europe, but not only Europe, is facing symptoms of secular stagnation. This has been a popular topic among economists starting a few years. I would tend to, to, as far as my personal view is concerned for what it's worth, is that there is something we should take seriously uh, if you look at the long-term uh, performance of key variables such as productivity, growth, investment, real interest rate, and so forth. There is a clear downward trend in the global economy and also in the, EU, in the EU economy. So the European economy is doing okay, but there might be risks of significant hurdles down the road and showing up. This is happening, and still with the economic challenges, in a framework of global economic tensions, uh, which are uh, in, in many cases, certainly in the case of global trade war, self-inflicted. This is my view. This has, of course, economic consequences, but also broadly, more broadly, governance consequences, as this is the trade version of a shift away from multilateralism towards bilateralism. Uh, you may use different terms, but this is what is happening. If you look back to, say, a few years ago, uh, in, in the global scenario and in Europe, no one would challenge the fact that, yes, we may be facing a global crisis, but we are in a multilateral environment which implies cooperation among key actors, uh, while now we are facing more conflicts and cooperation. Second challenge, technology. Uh, we are all excited about the new technologies, about the digital economy. We have to admit that this is good and bad at the same time. It's good because it offers new opportunities, including ways to reboost productivity growth, which is lagging behind, which is uh, weakening, as in my previous point I mentioned, but also uh, challenges, as the I will summarize the point as uh, saying that there is a risk of digital divide in a broad sense which has social and economic implications. And also, as this generates challenges in the economic sphere, of course, it generates many challenges. I would just mention two. One is taxation of the digital economy, and the other one is competition policy. 
in a digital economy against the background well known to all of us that if you ask what are the main companies in the digital economy, you hardly find a European company over there and you basically find US and uh, non-European or Chinese companies. So you have an additional element of uh, complexity in dealing with challenges. And then a third group, which is of course very artificially what, what I call non-economic challenges, namely migration, security, and climate change. All of these and others have, of course, social, technological, and economic implications, but they have also, so to speak, a life of their own and challenges of their own. So this is the panorama which the new commission is facing. And this is, in my view, well reflected in Ursula von der Leyen opening speech where many of these challenges are mentioned and where there is what I take as a commitment to stand up to those challenges and try to uh, to make the best out of these for the, for the good of European citizens. These are complex challenges, some of them are new. The first question I'd like to share with the group is uh, do we need a common framework to look at these challenges and can the MFF be that framework? Of course, duly uh, transformed and updated, not just and only in terms of how many resources are commanded, but especially also in terms of tools and mechanisms. Uh, being an economist, I tend to go back to the economics as all of, every time I launch myself in non-economic areas, so you will apologize, I apologize. But uh, if you look at the, uh, the way this set of challenges has challenged economic policy, you come to one basic conclusion. Uh, the, the one basic conclusion is that there is no single policy tool which would work to deal positively with those challenges. This is perhaps best uh, described when one thinks of monetary policy, and when one listens to what Mario Draghi keeps has been saying for some time now, monetary policy, which is completely changed since it was more normal a few years back, is risking to reach the limits of its transformation in a positive sense. And now, as you all know, if you look at the debate about monetary policy, you are beginning to see that there are many there is a lot of growing opposition to the new monetary policy framework in terms of QE, in terms of negative rates and so forth, showing a, a, a point which cannot be overstated, that this monetary policy alone is generally has, has provided benefits to the global economy in terms of getting the economy and the European economy out of the recession, but also is generating consequences. Some of those consequences uh, need a, uh, a complementary uh, contribution of other policy tools, name, mainly, namely structural measures, structural reforms at the national level and of course structural measures at the EU level, namely extensions and uh, upgrade of the single market project, which is the big structural program of Europe. And of course fiscal. Uh, Asking for fiscal support to governments a few years ago was not seen as exactly polite in policy discussion. Now uh, it's, uh, the problem is that uh, may, may many of us will we'll see whether this would uh, definitely, certainly that, that would be my personal position again for whatever it's worth, that we need to make a leap forward in terms of moving towards European fiscal capacity instruments beyond and in complement to possible reforms of the national fiscal uh, instruments including DSGP. So a second question would be to you, do we agree that monetary policy is now reaching a limit and that for that we need a reboost of structural or the structural agenda and we need to move forward towards fiscal capacity, which implies several elements, including 
financial instruments at the European level, safe assets, uh, in addition to what would be referred to as a European fiscal stance, which is not simply the sum of national uh, fiscal policies, but it's an independent fiscal policy stance, which of course requires instruments. And so again, we go to the MFF. To what extent, and if at all, can the MFF provide a contribution to generating a fiscal stance? Uh, well, if we decide to go that, down that road, how should we identify uh, targets of an independent uh, fiscal stance or functions or missions? Some of, all of these are already in the debate, so I'm not putting anything on the table that it's new. But certainly we need competitiveness instruments and this, of course, is very much related to how to exploit new technologies in terms of productivity growth. How can that be transformed into sustainable growth from a, several perspectives, including uh, environmentally sustainable growth, which requires an understanding how new technologies can contribute to that. Second function or mission would be convergence. This is, of course, as old as Europe. Uh, convergence and divergence forces have, have always been there at the national level, at the regional level, at the global level. There is some evidence that in an economy which is driven by technology augmented productivity, <coughs> more convergence and more technology diffusions are uh, elements which are needed to ensure the fact that growth is maximized and it is well distributed. Uh, so, to what extent should we upgrade our convergence policies to take into account the benefits but also challenges of new technologies? And how should we make sure that countries and regions and companies are as close as possible to the technological frontier rather than in the backyard and remain as laggards? Certainly this is, of course, a very well-known challenge, historical challenge in, in this country with a very large part of the country being systematically laggard, so with, with, with little or no convergence. Third element is stabilization. This is a, has been raising some uh, resistance. Uh, in my personal experience, whenever uh, meetings of finance ministers eventually began to think about stabilization, there was the usual divide between uh, those who would like more stabilization tools in the European Union and those who said, no, this is up to the national economies, national governments to provide stabilization. Let's not generate fiscal profligacy at the European level. I uh, would tend to disagree with this last statement. I think Europe needs a stabilization function. There is some discussion about which form should that take, uh, either an investment support or and or an unemployment insurance scheme, uh, which would uh, have some benefits. I would be happy to discuss. If some of you may know, this is a, a, an idea uh, launched in the poli policy debate by the previous, not the previous, the previous, previous Italian government uh, in the previous legislature. And I continue to believe this would be an important addition. But also, we would like to see more growth, but we would like to see more inclusive growth. This has become a mantra. Uh, let's not leave it as a mantra. Let's understand what it means in practice and let's uh, test on the European skin uh, the notion that is supported by what I consider to be some good evidence that more inclusion and more inclusiveness me means more growth and not the other way around. And it's not obvious that if you, if you grow more, you have to leave laggards behind. I would rather tend to agree that the opposite is true. Fifth element, I'm about to finish my list, is a, a group of issues which I would uh, collect under the, the, the title of European Public Goods. 
and European public goods include migration, include security, include defense, and others may be broad. It's, I would suggest that we use this terminology because that implies immediately the question if we think that Europe needs to be provided with public goods which are of European interest, what kind of resources and mechanisms should be devoted to producing them. So, this is an additional question and I conclude with two big questions. First of all, this is again very well known, where do we get the money? Uh, is it a 0.1 percentage increase in the MFF enough? Should we reallocate? Should we go towards the own resources alley and which kind of own resources? This is as old as EU, I think this cannot be avoided, especially if we think that some form of fiscal uh, stance at the European level is good. So we need to, to look at it from the spending side, but also from the, from the uh, revenue side, so to speak. And finally, do we have consensus for this agenda, provided that we agree? Uh, we have been, from a political point of view, Europe has been facing uh, a challenge. Uh, I would also go as far as saying as a threat that uh, Eurosceptics, Euro let me call them that way, a soft way, would uh, gain political support and this was expected to be one of the results of the past European Parliament elections. This eventually happened only to a minor extent and this is good news for me, but this is still a problem. Uh, there is growing evidence, at least this is what I see, that there has been, at least since the beginning of the global financial crisis, but even earlier, sooner than that, some link between the sentiment vis-a-vis -vis European institutions and the economic performance of the European economy, which of course has different uh, elements in the and strength in terms of performance, in terms of employment, in terms of security of the jobs and so forth. And this has reverberated in the decreasing trust vis-a-vis -vis European institutions. Uh, if trust is not rebuilt or is available in uh, reasonable amounts, of course, I suppose that we can measure trust, then it comes as a consequence to me that it is impossible to produce or strengthen European institutions. Mm -hmm. Institutions are about getting together and agreeing together on putting some infrastructure on, on society, uh, be it national or European. If we, don't, if we don't trust each other, we cannot build anything. And of course, building trust is one of the main challenges of governments or of institutions of countries. And one of the consequences of the crisis, of the global financial crisis, and of the translation into political resistance has been to lose trust about European institutions. So I've, it would be really nice if, the, the, if, if there is a strategy which encompasses some of the items I suggested, that we agree to have enough resources, and especially that we agree that we can trust each other more and therefore we can proceed towards building or strengthening existing institutions. The institution list is long, uh, but of course this is part of the, of the discussion. Thank you, sorry I took so much time. Now I resume my capacity, I understand, as, as chair, is that correct? So I uh, welcome panelists to this first uh, uh, panel. Laszlo Andor, Bridget Lafan, Marius Pomienski, and Silvano Presa, if I have the right list. So uh, I suggest that we start in this alphabetical order, which is the easier way it is. And Laszlo, good to see you, and you have the floor. Can we have, can we have the, um, ten minutes for each panel? Uh, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chairman, the colleagues. Uh, it is really a pleasure 
to be back uh, at the European University Institute to discuss the MFF, even if I'm probably one of those who are guilty with producing the current MFF, because uh, in 2011, when uh, we put forward the uh, multiannual financial framework for 2014 uh, to 20, um, I was indeed, especially on behalf of the European Social Fund, uh, part of uh, the process. And uh, um, if I uh, start with this, I would first of all like to appreciate uh, the great tableau which uh, Professor Paduan uh, presented to us. Uh, because it um, uh, reminds me the fact that in 2011 summer, when the, the, the present MFF was submitted, we more or less had an idea of what we were emerging from, the Great Recession, but I can tell you we didn't have the slightest idea of what we were walking into, the Eurozone crisis. And that was still the case in the summer of 2011 when this MFF uh, was submitted. Which means that if you want to uh, qualify the qu current MFF from this perspective, whether it connects well with a broader economic landscape, I would say that it did connect well with the long-term challenges. I think it is well uh, prepared and well founded that the Europe 2020 strategy for smart, sustainable and inclusive growth was first developed and you try to align the, uh, the budgetary capacity of the European Union on these long-term goals. But it did not connect at all with the short-term questions. Um, first of all, because it was not anticipated what was coming, but secondly, because it was not assumed uh, that a multi-annual financial framework would need to deal with short-term fluctuations, if you can call the Eurozone crisis a short-term fluctuation. It was supposed to be. Um, but we know why um, uh, it, it, it became a much greater uh, crisis. But that, means, that brings me to the second point, that yes, it's right to start with um, you know, the assessment of the broader landscape, including the global economic dynamics, uh, when we discuss the MFF. But uh, very concretely answering one of the questions that have been raised, in my view, the MFF cannot be the sole instrument uh, to, to respond uh, to those, simply because the MFF as a budgetary uh, framework is relatively small. It's, um, it's, it's a modest fiscal capacity as compared to all the global economic challenges, especially if you also factor in the limitations of uh, the monetary policy. So yes, the limitations of the monetary policy uh, you know, trigger uh, steps, consequences, implications on fiscal policy. In other words, to adapt the fiscal paradigm or the fiscal framework, which is uh, uh, especially timely, if not late uh, already. But, um, the, what we call the MFF, the EU Long-Term Budgetary Framework, is simply not equipped sufficiently to, to respond to these questions. So some kind of uh, embeddedness in the broader European economic governance and a stronger connection between uh, budgetary decisions in the national context at the European level would be required. These connections, in my view, are lacking. So, uh, you know, we, we can either have a, a broad discussion about the economic situation and how to reform economic governance in general, but in that case, we will spend very little time on the MFF itself, uh, because it plays a minor role in that. It's more the question of the stability and the growth pact, uh, the banking union, uh, the mandate of the European Central Bank, and uh, related issues. Uh, but. Um, the MFF would play a very little role. At the same time, I think we have to appreciate that um, the Commission, led by uh, Jean-Claude Juncker, actually made the first step to make this uh, connection. So installing two small instruments as um, a kind of fiscal capacity of the European Union inside the MFF is in a way crossing um, a red line, uh, which was perhaps an imaginary red line, uh, but nobody really wanted to connect uh, the MFF with the Monetary Union uh, 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 before, uh, but I think it is absolutely necessary. If you want a kind of theoretical explanation to that, 
I think it's not that uh, complicated. Uh, the point is that, you know, uh, in terms of the functions of fiscal policy, uh, the, the EU budget was primarily linked to, historically, to public goods uh, in the first order. Secondarily, redistribution, which is sometimes overrated, uh, because the actual redistribution is relatively small. Uh, and uh, stabilization, which is a third important budgetary function, was not linked at all to the European Union uh, uh, fiscal framework. And uh, I think what we went through in the last 10 years just demonstrate that this is a wrong paradigm. It just cannot continue uh, this way, that the European Union level uh, or the Eurozone level uh, doesn't play a role in fiscal uh, stabilization. In other words, doesn't respond to the business cycle. So somehow we need instruments which, one way or another, um, uh, respond to the, the business cycle, contribute to or facilitate or even encourage uh, counter-cyclical interventions. So the, the, the drama which uh, well, nearly led to the disintegration of the single currency <laughs> and the European Union as such in 2011-12 and 13 um, is, uh, is, is uh, by and large explained uh, by this uh, uh, factor, the lack of a fiscal capacity that would serve a stabilization function. Then, of course, the question is whether we would need to look for a solution within the MFF as such or outside, creating new instruments, new capacities. Um, why is this a relevant question? Simply because uh, the MFF is relatively small. It's stuck um, at um, around 1% of the European uh, GNI. This looks like a kind of political glass ceiling, which is very, very difficult uh, to, uh, to break through. And um, despite um, you know, very important um, earlier uh, studies, going back, if you want, uh, to the McDougall report, uh, pointed to the need for a more substantial fiscal capacity if Europe needs to be uh, sustainable as an integration, as a single market, as well as a monetary union. Um, it would need to reach uh, 5 to 7 percent of uh, centralization of uh, the GDP. We are stuck uh, with the 1 percent, and this gives rise to a variety of ideas like financial engineering, um, various types of innovation in the structural funds, uh, which are interesting, some of them promising, but still have the limits, still cannot uh, uh, shoot all the birds which would need to be uh, captured. So uh, I think um, uh, this is one of the very important questions, whether the recognition that a stabilization function would also be necessary at the European level. Um, and, and at the same time maintaining the glass ceiling um, is, is, is possible or not, um, needs to be uh, uh, discussed. Uh, because the product of this reconciliation is twofold. One, that the proposed instrument become, let's be honest, ridiculous. Um, the two little ones um, which are on the table. Um, and uh, we might at the same time cause damage to existing instruments which play a legitimate role, but then would need to be cut and downsized if uh, we also want to satisfy the fiscal uh, uh, needs for a sustainable monetary union. What do I have in mind? Uh, when you saw the proposal for the new MFF post-2020, uh, um, uh, put forward last year by Mr. Oettinger, um, much of the discussion was revolving around the old and new, that the old is outdated, it's obsolete, it has to be downsized, phased out, and then we have to give uh, the space to the new ones. I think this rhetoric is highly problematic. Are we Chatham House? Oh. <laughs> we're probably Chatham House. Any, in any case, in any case, in any case, uh, even if there is press. I think this is a nice strong opinion that this rhetoric is misleading. Uh, what would be, I think, the right rhetoric is that there are core functions or core parts of the European budget and there are additional ones. 
And then the question is, if there are additional uh, fiscal responsibilities uh, related to migration, related to globalization, related to climate, do we have to take out of the core, or, um, or, um, or, or do we need to read, uh, raise uh, new resources? Especially what I have in mind is the question of the cohesion, uh, because um, uh, I think the picture is quite misleading. In other words, it can be very easily misread, uh, because what you have seen in the last 10, 15 years, that most of the beneficiary countries of the cohesion policies um, have been producing uh, very robust uh, GDP growth, especially in the East. You have the very impressive performance of Poland, uh, more recently the Baltic countries. So one may say that, okay, cohesion can be much less. But the point is that GDP is a very imperfect indicator. And there are many, many other aspects, infrastructure development, uh, social investment, um, which would need to be performed uh, if we want to make this economic convergence uh, sustainable. These countries, yes, they experience economic growth higher than the European Union average. On the other hand, uh, there is a huge need for reinvestment in uh, human capital, because much of these countries are actually going through um, a, a, a significant depopulation, and uh, that also causing a, a political destabilization at uh, the same time. So uh, my uh, short conclusion is that, yes, a stabilization function is necessary. Um, your example, unemployment insurance or reinsurance is remarkable, either inside or, in my view, in, uh, rather outside the MFF. But those uh, should not come at the expense of um, uh, the cohesion instruments, which are badly needed also in the future, especially in order to rebuild uh, human capital through social uh, investment and to enhance the effectiveness of the cohesion instruments we have to do more also to look at how actually they operate whether the shared management is satisfactory or not in my view we would need to innovate how exactly these funds are distributed in the member states which uh, receive it because the space for abuse is too high and the so-called rule of law conditionality is a paper tiger which is not going to cut uh, uh, the butter. So we need to look for innovation also in operational sense, uh, in addition to the, the macro questions of the financial framework. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lasso. And, uh, you uh, went over by three minutes, but the, the overall budget constraints will hold at the same time. <laughs> so, Bridget. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, and can I add uh, the, to the President's welcome and welcome you all. Uh, the EU budget tends to be a niche interest, it's regarded as very technical, but in fact if you look at the history of European integration, the level of uh, integration that has been achieved, the deep interdependence in my view, I think the evidence suggests, could not have been achieved without budgetary power and resources. Yes, the EU is a regulatory giant and its power comes from the power of law, but at every major deepening of integration, it has always been accompanied by a budgetary payment of some kind or other. Think to the Rome Treaty, it was agriculture and social fund, and you think to the single act, and it was the doubling of structural funds. So I think what we're talking about really does matter uh, to the future of the European Union and its ambition. Uh, and I think that if the title is the EU towards 2030. So we're thinking of the EU as it confronts the third decade of the 21st century. Uh, and that, to me, there are two important challenges. Firstly, can the EU be strategic? And in that, I do not mean strategic just in a strategy terms, i.e. security and defence, but strategic about all it does in the world it now is. Uh, and that's, uh, that is a very, very big challenge for a hybrid political organization with high levels, uh, with large numbers of member states. And the second is, where does the supply of governance come from? The chair very ably set out all of the challenges we face, and I think they're not just European challenges, but they are global challenges. 
I think if we all were asked to put on a piece of paper what those challenges were, I think there would be a lot of over overlap. But the question today is not the demand for governance, it is the capacity to supply it. And I think that's a challenge of domestic, European and global level. And so I think we need to think in terms of the MFF in that broader uh, strategic context. I will, I will uh, look at four very quickly at four areas. Firstly, political context. Secondly, geopolitical context. Thirdly, the Green Deal. And fourthly, defence and security. So firstly, the political context. This is a time when we have a new commission coming in. It's the first time when a new commission has an ability to frame the MFF. There's a lot of negotiating time left. But at a time when uh, it is at least questionable where a deal is going to come from. There will be a deal. By the end of 2020, there will be a deal. But where is the deal going to come from? So looking at the European Parliament and the outcome of the European elections, uh, the Grand Coalition is no longer sufficient to deliver. Both the, the EPP and SND together, 336 votes, not enough. So it's going to, there will have to be agreement with the swing uh, with the swing groups, 108 in, in New Europe, and then the, the Greens, 74. So I think the coalition building in the, in the next European Parliament and where structural majorities will come from uh, is a major question. And we've already seen with the hearings on the commissioners that this has been quite a fraught process. The commission will not take office on the 1st of November. So again, this, this fragmentation we see in the European Parliament mirrors what has happened in domestic politics. They have fragmented over the last electoral cycles and we're now seeing it in the European Parliament. Then when we look at the member states, the classical cleavage on the budget, the main cleavage has always been net beneficiaries, net contributors. It is as night follows day, Attitudes towards the budget are predominantly driven by net contributor, net beneficiary. But underlying that, then, there is also attitudes towards different balances in policy terms. So it's not just the first cleavage, but there are others. So what do we see across the member states at the moment? Well, we have the Franco-German relationship, Macron uh, demanding reform, European sovereignty, having a very tough time at European level, uh, engaging with, uh, yes, getting some, some uh, change on the margins, but nothing, uh, nothing fundamental. Uh, we're at the end of the Merkel chancellorship. It's unclear who replaces her or what happens in German politics. Then we have that emerging, because of Brexit, the emerging Hansa League, the, the rich North European states, and someone referred to them to me yesterday as the no camp. In other words, whatever the question is, no is the answer. A bit like the DUP in Northern Ireland. Uh, Central Europe, we've already heard that despite growth, there are still needs and still gaps. And then, of course, the Southern European states, uh, ch economic challenges, but also uh, on the front line in the challenge of uh, with migration. So it will be an extremely important test, in my view, of the next commission. It will tell us a lot about the van der Leyen commission, about the post-Merkel-Juncker-Tusk Europe, uh, what they will, what the, what the eventual MFF outcome will be. I think it will be, it is the first major challenge for the new commission. Uh, and it will tell us a lot about the ability, ability of the EU 27, and I'm assuming it will be an EU 27, although I could be wrong. This can change by the day. Uh, to forge a collective accommodation in response to the next decade. So I think the politics are very interesting. Uh, and I have no doubt that the EU, in its inimitable way, will find a way through this but it'll, be, it'll tell us a lot about the uh, political forces and balances. Then to the geopolitics. I'm very struck by the commission president-designate called this the geopolitical commission. She's right. 
uh, she is reflecting uh, in a very stark way the nature of the world we live in. And there's no doubt that the EU has had a series of geopolitical shocks over the last five years. You could argue it began before, but certainly over the last five, with uh, disruptive Russia from 2014 on, disruptive US from 2016 on, nearer home, what we've seen in the last couple of weeks in terms of uh, Turkey, uh, and the migration crisis from 2015. Uh, and we also, that's also been, uh, means Europe lives in a much more dangerous neighborhood. Uh, neither the United States nor Russia have the best interests of the EU uh, at, in, their, in terms of their preferences. Uh, it is the first time when, when in living memory that there is an American president that uh, not just doesn't support the EU but actively opposes it. And of course we know about the Russians, this, the disruptive capacity of Russia and their payment, uh, their, uh, the flow of funding to the radical right. So, and regardless, if Trump loses the next election in the United States, I think the US has fundamentally, the pivot to Asia started under Obama, but has America first has disrupted US foreign policy, and we have no idea, the, Ameri the Pax Americana era is over. And so, what then, how does Europe manage a world of greater, great power competition, China, US, and how does it mediate that relationship, that, that its relationships both to the US and to China, and then southwards to Africa? So, if ever the EU needed a collective capacity to respond to the outside world, it is now. Then, looking to the Commission, uh, to the next, uh, looking to the Commission, to the next, um, uh, what's been framed as the key deal. I've no doubt, again, the Green Deal is one of the, uh, is something that uh, European citizens will respond to. It's something that is required for the world. And therefore, the question is, what role does the EU play and the EU budget play in that transition uh, over the next uh, 10 to 20 years? There's uh, the Just Transition Fund. What would that mean? I think what it certainly means is Europe will have to devote far more attention and resources to energy and transport, but also to the distrib distributive effects of climate change. Agriculture, sustainable agriculture in Europe. Um, I think it's now called the farm to the fork strategy. What, uh, what does that mean? And that certainly means a lot more funding required uh, for the green agenda over the, next, uh, over the next period. And then the other area where I think there will be a demand, there already is in the MFF a commitment to more spending uh, on uh, a European border and coast guards, an operation operational by 2024, the European Defence Fund, uh, again a major increase. Defence is one of the areas because of what's happening in NATO and with the US that Europe is going to have to pay a lot of attention to. And it is the one field where the combined effort of Europe is less than the parts. It is the one area where it should be possible to get real value added from some collective capacity uh, in a sh relatively short uh, period of time. So for all of these reasons, there are uh, across the range of the MFF all sorts of other really important issues in terms of the internal uh, economic, uh, European economy. But I think that Europe, the world beyond Europe, the world outside Europe will bear very heavily on this continent over the next five and then 10 years. And uh, if Europe doesn't develop a collective capacity and to be strategic in this period, then I think it would be a taker rather than a shaper of the world. And it really has got to look at what, how it creates more collective capacity and to make sure that that collective capacity it is sufficient for the EU to be a player in that world of a great power rivalry. Uh, and of course, Europe will continue to remain committed to multilateral institutions, 
but if those institutions can't function any longer, then what does Europe do? So I think for all of those reasons, our discussion on the MFF is a broader discussion about the challenges that Europe faces over the next five years. Thank you. Thanks very much also for raising the issue of what can Europe do in international organizations, a topic that's been very important and hopefully will become more important now. Uh, are you still there? Failed me. Thank, you. thank you very much for uh, for the floor and uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for for inviting me to to represent the European Code of Auditors at this workshop in Florence. Uh, listening to the keynote uh, speech, uh, I was wondering, well, um, it's not for the auditors really to to comment so much on the on the spending priorities or on the size of the of the EU budget. But then towards the end of your of your of your intervention, list of questions, I found it thing for me really when you, when you talk about the trust and consensus because what we do um, we focus not so much on the on the content but on the process on the how how to get there how to organize the process in order to uh, to reach the objectives whichever they they are this is a subject to political debate and decision so let me just for the start name three characteristics that that, that the court uh, has uh, has identified as as the as the key components of the process would be Transparency and clarity, evidence-based decision making, consistent application of a, of a, of a criterion of a EU added value as a as a driving force in, in making decisions uh, about what becomes or not uh, the, the the priority, and uh, the fact that setting objectives must precede allocating resources. I know it's a, it sounds self-evident, but as I'll try to. Um, to, to, to show to, to you in, in a few slides, uh, it's not so uh, evident in practice. So, well, for, for an auditor, being in Florence is a specific experience. Luca Di Pacioli, uh, father of uh, accrual accounting, was a, was, a, was a citizen of Florentine Republic, born and died in San, San Sepulcro, not far from, uh, from where we are here. So it's a particular pleasure for me to, uh, to be here. Well, you mentioned new technologies. Uh, when uh, when, when President Juncker announced uh, uh, the launch uh, of the reflection paper. Well, it sounded a bit like a launch of a new phone uh, uh, event uh, with a promise of a faster processor, larger screen, and improved uh, functionality. Quicker, bigger, better, in, uh, uh, in short. So that President uh, Juncker you know, promised or, or had ambition of, of, of delivering something bigger, better, and quicker by the end of March 2019 originally. Uh, well, you know, uh, mid-October, uh, so, so we, are, we all know it hadn't uh, really come true. So we were determined, despite, uh, despite uh, some skepticism that, that we had originally about the, the idea, so we were determined to provide uh, our advice and contribute to the process within the limits of our mandate uh, to help the, the EU realize these, uh, these, ambitious, uh, these ambitious targets. So uh, why the court? Uh, uh, why the court uh, does take a, take a role, and what is the role? We are not, of course, we are not the policymakers. We don't um, we don't take active part in it. What we do, we, we <coughs> audit. But through the through the audits, we gather um, quite quite a lot of experience. Um, uh, so the accumulated knowledge and experience uh, let us believe we uh, we have something to say as a, as an advisory uh, voice in the in the debate. So. So apart from reports, different audit reports, we do issue opinions on legislative proposals or we issue briefing papers on, uh, on important issues of, of public interest, uh, which is the case in the current MFF um, debate. So, so we produce a number of, of, uh, of briefing papers. We summarized uh, all of them in, in, a, in, a big, uh, in a bigger document called ESA Remarks in brief on the Commission's legislative proposal for the next multi-annual financial framework. So my intervention is, is based on, on, on this document. So quicker, a need for speed. Uh, I think my, my former speaker mentioned the time as a, as a component, as, a, as an issue indeed. Uh, quicker in what sense? We couldn't agree more. We agree that a quicker is a, is a master time, is a, is, a, is a real issue in how the MFF is being conceived, produced, and then implemented. So, uh, so we advised that it must be quicker in three main ways. 
a prompter start to spending programs, a shorter duration during which spending commitments can be made, and an earlier target date for settling the commitments outstanding at the end of the period. Such are the lessons learned from, from what we see in annual exercise of auditing the budget, budget implementation, budgetary and financial management. These are, these are uh, from our auditing perspective, quite obvious truths, and we felt compelled to, to, to spell them out quite, uh, quite explicitly. Well, of course, we are still a long way to the starting line. Uh, MFF negotiations are always long, we, we, we know that. So, some of us keep uh, looking at our uh, iPhones and other, other, other smartphones to see what's happening down there in Brussels. So we are very much down the snake, uh, but still not, it's not there yet. The, the, the initial target of March 2019 proved too ambitious. Now it's end 19, and last week, two weeks ago, we had the parliament asking for a contingency plan B in case things don't get ready by December 2020, so that uh, the, 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 the programs get, get, get running. It's always a, big, uh, a bit of a chicken and egg problem, if I may call it that way. On the one hand, uh, MS, uh, member states need to agree on the total MFF size to know how to much, how much uh, spent on, 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 on the global. On the other hand, they, they, they tend to, they have to agree uh, how, to, how much to spend on each priority. So, of course, nothing is, uh, is agreed until everything is agreed. Plus, uh, inconvenient complication of Brexit just completes the, the picture. And, uh, yeah, and uh, I tend to, to say and tend to think we are not far from, from last MFF scenario. Where, where this took much longer than initially planned, that initially anybody, uh, everybody wished, uh, wished to see. So, uh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> so there's not only a long walk to the starting line, which is, which which where we still are, but also a sort of a marathon in the implementation period. Um, we still are in the in the seven year. Philosophy, even though there are signs, yes, this, this might get shorter, more aligned to um, to e European Parliament and Commission mandates, but not this time round, not yet. Uh, and in fact, the cycle will last much longer than the seven years. That that uh, that's a headline number. Uh, it all started already two years ahead of the of the of, of, of the starting point. It will last seven years. Then there are three more years to. Um, the commitments uh, to, to, to pay outstanding commitments, and then still the closure of, of individual programs may take another another few years. Uh, in this year's audit, or last year's audit of 2018, we still had quite a lot of spending belonging to 2007-13 um, period in the pipeline. So it's 12 at least, and sometimes even even more than that. It's not a it's not a very good practice. Not a very good how you get uh, your 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 objectives achieved. So, ambition or continuity, linking to, to, the, to, to the topic of this, of this panel, uh, well, more continuity than, than change, probably, more continuity than, than ambition, prompt start, probably not very likely anymore, uh, seven year commitment period, which means a rather long implementation marathon, uh, but at least one positive side, uh, the rule n plus three becomes rule n minus uh, n plus two, uh, which means that at least one year shorter implementation can be achieved. Now, quicker, bigger, bigger budget, more spending on political priorities. So, uh, we have called for transparency about two key aspects of spending proposals without getting into, into discussion on, on the priorities themselves. First, about the comparison about the, between the current and the next MFF. So, some level of transparency, which I mentioned in, in my opening opening a sense is necessary uh, for the reader, for the public, for the general public to, to regain trust in, in what the EU does. And secondly, about the extent to which the EU political ambitions are being met by funds outside the scope of the MFF. And, and here I link to, to Laszlo's, uh, well, no, yes, I agree, MFF is not the only instrument by far, uh, but of course it has to be transparently presented and put in the context of a, of a, of a broader financial plan for the MFF going beyond the uh, budgetary budgetary process. So, uh, as I'm auditor, I can't help uh, showing you some numbers. Uh, so what we did, we tried to, um, to really answer the question with the MFF, is it really bigger? Or the next MFF, is it going to be much bigger? Or by how much bigger? Because if you look at the numbers, 
uh, uh, the, the headline numbers, you, you may have the feeling that, uh, that it will be much bigger. But you have to take into account the factors like inflation, Brexit, incorporating of EDF into the budget, and changes, programs moving from one, from one MFF heading to, to another. So what we see that, in our view, if, if you compare both MFFs uh, on a comparable basis, like with, like, uh, with the use of 2018 prices, the next MFF will be about 5% bigger, according to the Commission's proposal, of course, but because we know that uh, the final MFF uh, may, be, may be quite different from, from the initial proposal, so around 53 billion euro more in, in real terms as compared to, um, to, the, um, to the previous MFF, which is considerably less than 18% increase that you get if you just compare the, the totals presented in the, in the proposal without uh, the adjustments. Some programs will move, uh, which, which also shows um, a change in, in, in priorities or possible change in priorities. Uh, there is a lot of movements. I'm not going to go one by one with them. The most prominent is, is Erasmus Plus, making its way from, from the current uh, MFF heading 1A competitiveness into the new cohesion environment. So the, the structure is also slightly uh, changed, and one should bear it in mind while, uh, while looking at the, at the MFF structure. Of course, to finance new priorities or to, to, to finance reprioritized priorities, you have to you have to either get uh, new money or find uh, or, or find savings in, in, in old existing money. So so from what we calculated, from what, what we saw, uh, there's there's going to be 63 million billion euro savings from from cuts in the in the CAP in the um, in the Common Agricultural Policy, which is then redistributed among new new MFF uh, headings, and, well, genuinely new 52 billion euro is necessary to finance uh, all, the, uh, all, the prior, all, the, all the spending programs as planned by, by the Commission. What's important, I, I'm again uh, coming back to Laszlo's point, of course the MFF is not the only source of finance for EU policies. So the gap between the, the political ambitions and the EU budget um, has a tendency to be filled out by other sources of funds, either at national level or, or elsewhere. So co-financing, of course, is, 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 is one example. So, so the move to, uh, to increasing proportion of EU funds um, being co-financed is, is a way. All financial instruments and budgetary guarantees, so all the EIB business, uh, if I may put it in inverted commas, yes, this is a growing, a growing reality. Uh, and it's also a source of finance of EU policies. Uh, the ESM, uh, the, the fact that, uh, that the EU can, can, can generate or can, can achieve their objectives also through non-budgetary instruments or the policy instruments. What's important, we have called on the Commission to be more transparent about how the EU will fund its political ambitions by publishing what we call a comprehensive medium to long term financial plan complementing the MFF. So the MFF is not the only part of the of uh, not the only way of, of financing and achieving EU policies. So, bigger ambition or continuity uh, in terms of size, yes, slightly bigger, but still more continuity than change. And finally, a better budget. So we focus on, on four aspects in trying to analyze the, 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 EU, the, the Commission proposal. And uh, we called to improve efficiency by focusing EU funds where they can add most value. This is the headline I, I gave you at the beginning. The concept of European added value as the criterion to allocate funds. But first of all, this concept has to be properly defined, which we, we couldn't really see in, uh, in, the, in the Commission proposal. Greater provision for flexibility to move funds around if priorities change. This, I think, also corresponds to the point, points made before. Uh, uncertainty of, of, of the world we are living requires uh, for the budget to be able to, to, to react quickly to, to the changing environment. Fewer, simpler and more performance oriented programs and uh, uh, probably with fewer objectives, with fewer indicators, the current 720 something which, uh, which is a total number of indicators presented in the, in the program statements for the EU budget is definitely too many. And we also called on the EU to strengthen accountability and audit arrangements, particularly with respect to the results achieved by the, by the EU action, where we saw, we identified a number of 
gaps, making, making the whole process less transparent, less accountable. So, uh, we formed six proposals. I'm not going to, I know I'm probably behind by my time schedule. Yes. Uh, yes, thank you for, for, for confirming I, that. I can confirm. The one thing that I wanted still to, to, um, to show is that, well, we know and we, we recognize the, the inherent complication and difficulty of the process of creating an MFF in the sort of multi-layer environment. There are so many streams of strategic thinking, of strategic objective setting, that putting MFF in this context is a hell of a job. And, uh, but uh, what, what seemed to us rather, rather evident, sadly, is that paradoxically the MFFs of the budgetary procedure, budgetary mechanism, substitute to some extent uh, objective setting uh, in, in other proper ways. So instead of having first objective set, you see there's no alignment in terms of time between different um, different strategies, 2020, Paris Agreement, Sustainable Development Goals, they're all set at a different time frame and that comes MFF. So MFF effectively plays the role of, uh, of objective setting uh, through allocating uh, budget. So it's a little bit turned upside down, putting cart uh, before the horse. Uh, to some extent we wanted to, to flag this as, a, as an issue. So I will go to the very end of, uh, of, the, of this uh, short presentation. So, we think, well, there is a little bit of a missed opportunity to rethink the EU budget, the current exercise. There is too much continuity and probably too little ambition. Uh, perhaps it's not the right time. Brexit is, uh, is probably not giving too much of a, of a, of a leverage to, to brave uh, and, uh, and broader thinking. Incremental improvements, which are, which are the every seven years, is, is, is not enough in our view. And after Brexit, we think, we the court auditors, that the uh, EU should strive harder to improve the efficiency of spending and transparency about the cost and benefit of EU action. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. If I may use my position as chair, let me, can I disagree on a, a very brilliant exposition and the fact that time is not right. We have heard that many times for many issues, including the UK participation in the Eurozone. And I disagree. And this is my personal view. Sorry for the intrusion. <laughs> no offense, thank you. <laughs> Silvano Perez, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for inviting me to, uh, to this workshop. Um, I also start from uh, the theme that was chosen uh, from, for uh, this session, which is um, ambition uh, versus continuity, but I will link uh, to, the, uh, to the keynote speech uh, by the chair and the challenges that have, uh, have, been, uh, have been identified. Uh, the chair was asking, uh, is there a common framework uh, on which uh, there is broad agreement? I think it can be argued that there is uh, such a framework. Uh, our leaders uh, in different declarations uh, in uh, Bratislava and Rome, in the EU strategic agenda that has been adopted. There is a broad consensus on the challenges, uh, including the ones uh, that uh, you, chair, uh, you chair mentioned. And uh, the proposal of the Commission for the next MFF uh, has uh, uh, taken that uh, indeed as a starting point. Uh, my uh, proposition here, it will be to say that uh, there is more ambition than continuity, unlike the, what uh, um, the, the Court of Auditors representative uh, told us now. And I will try to focus on four areas where I see I would uh, stress the element uh, of, uh, of ambition. Uh, these challenges that have uh, been identified, economic, uh, uh, trade, uh, technology, immigration, security, internal, external, um, did not allow to live uh, with the MFF, with the spending programs at EU level as, uh, as, as it is, and so the need to move away from uh, the status quo. Uh, and this uh, is reflected uh, in uh, uh, the, the, the proposal for the next uh, MFF with uh, the increase in spending in, uh, in areas which are uh, meant to address uh, the, uh, the competitiveness uh, of the EU, uh, the uh, transition uh, to favor a transition towards a digital economy to uh, increase the expenditure for uh, research and innovation 
to uh, facilitate and increase the learning mobility across uh, the EU, uh, to address and uh, provide uh, uh, public good, uh, whether it is in the management of uh, migration flows or uh, to uh, provide incentive for cooperation for industrial uh, development for defense uh, at the at EU level and also to develop uh, a certain autonomy in terms uh, of defense and uh, uh, increasing spending substantially for internal and external uh, security, border management, but also uh, say the action, the projection of the EU in uh, outside, in particular in the neighboring uh, areas and in Africa in, in particular. Um, this has been done by modernizing, this is the catchword that is often used, also uh, the policies which remain uh, actually a large part of the spending, which is uh, uh, the common agricultural policy and, uh, and cohesion, which have an element of convergence, which was uh, an important point that the chair uh, underlined, and inclusiveness, inclusiveness for uh, the regions that are least developed, inclusiveness of uh, the rural areas, and at the same time, modernizing uh, the, the way they are implemented. Uh, in the case of the common agricultural policy, through uh, a different uh, implementing mode and leaving more leeway for member states uh, to develop their own uh, strategic plan fit for uh, their situation and uh, for uh, the cohesion policy to have uh, a stronger concentration uh, on, on key areas uh, in, the, in the use of, of funds. Um, so this is the modernization and moving away from uh, the status quo. A second uh, area of ambition, although it doesn't look uh, so much when you just look at the figures, is uh, the climate change challenge. Uh, the Commission uh, proposes uh, to raise uh, the uh, climate-related uh, expenditure from 20 to 25 percent of uh, total spending. This doesn't seem such a, a big uh, leap forward. But if you take into account that uh, in the overall balance, uh, the proposal is uh, uh, reducing expenditure for, slightly reducing expenditure for uh, agriculture and cohesion, which at present account for almost four, uh, three fourths of all climate related expenditure. And you take account that some of the um, increasing programs uh, like uh, defense uh, or learning mobility or border uh, controls uh, do not have a high component of uh, spending for to address uh, climate uh, challenges. So this um, shift from 20 to 25, so it will be challenging and uh, uh, the Commission has proposed specific targets across uh, uh, different programs that uh, uh, will require a major effort for all the stakeholders uh, to, uh, to meet, and that including uh, agriculture and, uh, and cohesion. So even there, I would say there is ambition. Um, a, a third element of ambition, uh, it has to do on the design of the spending programs. And uh, I would uh, say catch it uh, under the word of streamlining the, uh, the, the spending programs at EU level. The number of programs have been reduced uh, by one third from 58 uh, to, to 37. Uh, also, uh, some uh, uh, more coherence in the presentation. Just to provide a couple of examples of what that means, uh, all the financial instruments and uh, guarantees that have been uh, developed over time in different layers, they will all be combined in one program that is called InvestEU, which is an EU uh, budgetary guarantees that covers uh, intervention using market-based uh, instrument in four uh, policy area, and so there will be one window uh, entry point uh, to, uh, to provide support uh, with market-based instrument at the, at the EU level. The other example, we can take uh, the external actions where there is uh, now a um, consolidated program pulling together the neighborhood uh, expenditure, uh, the integrating the European uh, Development Fund, having the thema thematic uh, programs in that, and this equips uh, the EU with uh, a program which is uh, much more similar to what uh, 
uh, member states uh, uh, do have an external policy instrument. They don't have a neighborhood Africa thematic. They have a budget for external policy, and this can be adjusted to, uh, to uh, the uh, evolution of the situation. And if we think of Africa, I mean, the, uh, the, what will be the, 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 the pain point in five years' time may not be exactly what we have now. And so, to have a consolidated instrument that allows the EU to adapt and respond instead of inventing <coughs> a special vehicle to that will also help in making the EU more effective. Uh, a fourth uh, area of ambition, and this has to do uh, to the issue of creating trust that was uh, mentioned by, uh, by the Chair, uh, but also to uh, promote uh, structural uh, reform is the stronger link uh, between uh, the policy coordination at, uh, through the so-called uh, European semester and the use of, uh, of the funds. Uh, the, uh, the European semester has now uh, a specific uh, uh, section related to the priority areas for investment in the areas where uh, member states are asked uh, to make uh, particular efforts in terms of structural reforms and to link this uh, to the use of uh, the EU funds, and in particular for, with the cohesion policy, the structural funds. It makes uh, a stronger link uh, with the policy uh, coordination and therefore having a, a, an economic governance at the EU level where also the EU budget can play a role and influence uh, the choices towards uh, uh, better uh, economic outcomes uh, is, uh, is a relevant uh, aspect. And uh, uh, still related to trust, uh, the idea to, to make a link uh, between uh, the use uh, of um, EU funds and the protection of uh, the EU financial interest uh, uh, and to ensure that the money is, uh, is, is properly spent uh, is also uh, an element that builds uh, trust between the different uh, uh, views and, and groupings uh, within, uh, within the EU. And it is also a way uh, to have some uh, leverage uh, to protect uh, the, the EU budget uh, from using in case of uh, generalized deficiency in the, the use of, uh, of the funds. Um, last but not least, I would say also in terms of ambition, uh, there is uh, ambition on the financing of the EU budget. Uh, there, uh, I would uh, stress uh, two elements. The first uh, one is uh, the introduction of a, of a basket of, uh, of new own resources, which uh, would take away, uh, the, uh, the, the, to some extent, the focus on the, on the contributions. It is the choice of the own resources uh, has been also related to uh, a way to promote uh, EU policies like environmental or, or um, fight against uh, climate change uh, in the case of uh, the, the contribution based on the quantity of uh, uh, plastic packaging not recycled or to um, give a share of uh, the um, uh, ETS system for the, the, the emissions uh, to attribute that uh, to EU is a way to uh, make a link with the common good of uh, having policies that uh, try to uh, mitigate uh, the, the negative effects of, uh, of uh, climate change. Uh, but the second important uh, and ambitious element there is uh, the phasing out of the rebates, uh, the, uh, the exit of the of the UK from, uh, from uh, the, the European Union, although unfortunately it has also provided the opportunity to get uh, rid of the debates that have been uh, built uh, with different layers uh, over time. Uh, this uh, uh, has uh, an effect in terms of transparency or in the financing of the budget. It has also an effect in terms of fairness. Uh, if one takes uh, the, the whole package of the, uh, the, the Commission proposal for, for uh, the next uh, seven-year round, the effect would be, and most of this effect uh, comes uh, from the phasing out of the rebates, is that uh, unlike at present, uh, where the uh, richest member states pay a lower percentage of the GNI to the EU budget than the relatively poor, 
that would rebalance uh, the sort of, uh, um, say, contribution effort uh, measured as a proportion of uh, the, the relative wealth in a, a much uh, stronger way than it is at present. And it would make uh, the EU budget fairer also on, on the revenue side. So, all in all, I would say that uh, uh, there is ambition in the, in the, in the proposal and uh, that uh, uh, the, although the, the EU budget is small, uh, as Landro was uh, saying so, but in the areas where the spending is proposed, uh, there is where the EU can make a difference, and it does make a difference. And uh, with the package uh, as, as, as proposed, uh, the EU would be equipped to address uh, the challenges that, uh, uh, on which uh, that there is, I think, a large agreement. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm, I'm, thanks very much. Yes, I, we have some time, not that much time, uh, for uh, individual interventions. And I'd like, first of all, to thank the panelists for a very rich set of contributions. Let me just uh, spend 30 seconds to remind what, in my view, are some of the key points. First of all, the size of the instrument and to what extent do we need additional instruments. I think this was what, one important point. Second, the issue of governance, both in terms of supply of governance, as Bridget mentioned, and in terms of global governance, which calls the role, the global role of the EU. And then a lot of uh, discussion, fascinating discussion, of the uh, tension between continuity and ambition, which is an ever-lasting uh, tension. And uh, my personal view is that we need a bit more ambition than continuity exactly because the challenges are to some extent larger, but this is my personal view. So I'd like to invite you to raise your flags, put your flags on a vertical fashion. Uh, I, I would like to give some a couple of minutes each to the panelists before we close, and I apologize, but I will have to close at 3.30 sharp because I have to catch a train back. Sorry for being so aggressive, but this is a time constraint. So, the floor is open. Yeah, thank you, and um, first let me thank you collectively for the readiness to accept this invitation. I hope that your enthusiasm will uh, be maintained even at the end of the, of the panel. Uh, I don't know if everyone can agree with the Silvano list of ambitions, and uh, they were very uh, helpful. There is one point uh, that I want to request uh, the attention where I think that the uh, Commission could have been more ambitious is the length of the uh, duration of the MFF. Uh, uh, Marius already mentioned that this uh, level uh, is uh, very clear to all of us. Uh, the length of the negotiation it is not a novelty if we look back to the past, uh, as happened every year. Uh, Parliament has raised it several times to align uh, the uh, duration uh, of the um, MFF with the duration of the legislation is probably too short. Parliament has recognized it in the, one of the last resolution of the old parliament uh, to extend the duration to 10 years. And this year was the perfect timing because the five year this year will coincide with the new commission in 2024. So we could have, uh, the, let's say, a, a mechanism that with the duration of 10 years we can then involve uh, the new commission created a rolling system where there is, a, let's say, the uh, intervention and uh, the presence of the new parliament and the new commission each time that you have a midterm revision. So that's, let's say, is my question linked to the, uh, where I think that we could have been, uh, let's say, more ambitious. Thank you. Thank you. I again invite you to raise your flag so I can Thank you very much. Uh, um, I think we have been very ably and convincingly reminded of the enormous challenges uh, the European Union is confronted with. Um, and we have been reminded of what the Commission has proposed, uh, which uh, was certainly ambitious in many elements, 
also in abstract too, certainly uh, not to the orders of magnitude which have been raised uh, by, by Professor Paduan, for example. Now, what would be interesting would be um, to learn a little bit about what is the state of the negotiations. Uh, I mean, we have now had 15 months of negotiations. Um, we are uh, seeing this is going to European Council today or tomorrow. And uh, while there is a new commission incoming, a new parliament finding its feet, it will not be able to pretend that nothing has happened. We have we are already very far down the road in these negotiations, I sense, and what one hears is that what one hears is that they are possibly um, going to be even less ambitious than uh, what has been criticized as not being enough from a commission point of view. So uh, maybe we could learn a little bit where we are uh, at the moment in the, in the negotiations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I have a observation because most of the presentations that we had this afternoon were based on the original uh, proposal by the Commission. And I completely agree with Silvano's assessment that in that particular context, which was the context of Brexit, the proposal of the Commission was quite ambitious, including on the very delicate question of the overall ceiling for expenditures. But to my knowledge, and according to the well-known uh, phenomenon of path dependency, the negotiations among governments have quite substantially modified the scenario for the very simple reason that, to my knowledge, again, I am aware that there, are no, there is no agreement on the overall ceiling and there is an attempt to reduce quite substantially that ceiling based on the well-known dynamics of tension between net contributors and net beneficiaries. There is no agreement, again, to my knowledge, on, even on the idea of new resources, new own resources. There is no agreement on the other important proposal which was presented by the Commission on the new form of conditionality based on the respect of the rule of law. So uh, I know the situation is complicated for many reasons, the new commission, the new parliament. But we have a very paradoxical situation which is not new, that whilst very important progress has been achieved on the approval of the individual regulation that are meant to implement the overall frame, for most of them we are close to an agreement. Of course, now there is a new parliament and the new parliament will have a say on this regulation. There is still little progress achieved on what the expert called the negotiating box, to be very honest. So I think, uh, I don't know whether we will be able to get this information today. Uh, should, the subject should be discussed by the heads of state and governments between today and tomorrow. I don't know whether they will have time. But I think that we have to put things in context, taking into consideration also the results of the, or non-results achieved so far in the negotiations between the governments. Thank you. One thing which strikes me is um, that we have to answer the question of how we um, weigh up uh, what we might see as an optimal budget versus the speed uh, by which we have to get agreed. Um, if this is delayed, um, and we are, I think most people are realistically now talking about the German presidency, um, we're talking about an extremely late start. Um, so is it better to compromise on some of the contentious issues to get it into place quicker, uh, given that the kind of challenges which we are facing actually require responses rather soon uh, than later? Um, my second point is um, being realistic in the end about um, how quickly we get back to the state one. Um, in the end, we will probably get back um, it is in many ways uh, we can discuss how negative that is. Um, but the finance ministers have a tendency um, to look uh, under the line in the end. Um, so. Maybe
maybe we have to find ways of working with that rather than trying to wish it away. Um, so if we can, um, for example, look at things like uh, match funding, allocated funding uh, to the more developed countries, um, that could be one way where you can um, assure some of the finance ministers that maybe things can work out uh, differently uh, underneath the bottom line. And my final point was just on European public goods. I think we need to be careful what we call European public goods. Um, I wrote something on this 10 years ago that shows how much the debate changes. Um, but uh, there's something peculiar about these. Um, uh, we often talk about public goods when we mean that it would be more effective to do things at the European level. That's not the same thing. Um, because when it becomes effective, then it's also a question of practice. It's a question of do countries, do populations want to do it jointly at the European level, or are they willing to incur a certain level of inefficiency to continue to do it at the national level? Um, I think that uh, is not the characteristic of traditional public goods. I think the public goods we need to talk about at the European level are also ones um, where we have distinctive uh, cross-border or interdependent element um, where one country cannot act uh, individually uh, without affecting everyone else. Um, and I think we have seen in areas such as migration, um, there is a very differential impact across the European Union. Um, so even if you could argue that there's a public good, that doesn't solve the difficulty of the distribution challenge we have, and uh, the uh, mechanisms we use, whether that's the budget or other mechanisms. Thank you very much. I have uh, three requests, uh, uh, and I'd like to close it here, sorry about that, uh, so that I can give some time to the panelists. Johannes? Thank you. thank you very much, uh, and Professor Parun, I want to also thank you for the reference to the ECB and its monetary policy and the challenges that we face in, uh, in pursuing uh, monetary policy in an environment where fiscal uh, support is, is more timid. Um, but but I'm, I'm, I want to be a bit provocative. I think it's enormous how consensual many of the points were, uh, what you said, what, what Andre Laszlo said, and, 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 and others, and also the, the kind of attempts by the Commission to, to kind of provide a, a bit more ambitious proposal. But I, I, I just, I've, I was at the Eurogroup last week, and, and if you compare the reality of the discussion there around the BICC, it, it couldn't be starker. Uh, so I'm, 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 I'm asking how, in, in view of all these challenges, how, how can we match that with the political reality? So my question would be, do we need to think new structures, new instruments, in the BICC, and we have a panel discussion tomorrow on, on, on that aspect. But just to give an example, I mean, there, there's the possibility of an IGA, and, and there could be a subset, uh, quite, I mean, it's quite provocative, but there could be a subset of a coalition of willing going ahead. Or do we need to think outside MFF further by saying uh, fiscal support needs to come by coordinating national fiscal policies with a response similar to 2009? So, is the MFF really a platform, or is it more constrained? There's always an element of constraints everywhere, so... But, but a constrained platform. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, just to follow uh, the, your question. Is it really possible? And you are facing papers and programs to be implemented partly as it happened to us. Is it then a possibility just to come to a certain prolongation to the final years of the existing MFF and then to go directly to a five year period, which always was on the agenda of many institutions? And I would like to uh, ask also the call of politics do you have any figures? Do you, do you intend to work on the side of contribution of member states? Because now, when you see a lot of documents, many Figures right now are presented in the public debates what these sort of commission proposals mean, or let's say 
puisque toi, en tant que commission, tu ne penses pas que les membres de la CETA et de la CETA ne sont pas en train de faire. Do you work hard on this, or is it too much of a protection? Thank you very much, last speaker. Thank you very much. I think uh, we shouldn't concentrate so much on the current Commission's proposal because it's not up to the Commission to be uh, courageous or uh, to change uh, the mind. It's up to the leaders of the European Union. And unfortunately, uh, whenever the budget is discussed among the leaders, uh, this is usually an issue which is uh, either extremely controversial or something which is uh, coming as a, as a second priority, not for finance ministers, certainly, but, uh, but uh, I mean government leaders. Uh, the budget is always seen as a, uh, as a tool which is not extremely efficient by the different member states, but that created already some sticky consequences in terms of business structures, administrative units, etc., uh, etc., et that are relying on the budget, and that's why we are rather speaking about continuity than uh, major reforms of the, of the budget. And I would like to uh, raise one point, which, which stems very much from the excellent uh, uh, opening of the chair. Uh, do you think that with uh, the developments in the Eurozone, with the technological developments, and especially in the outside Europe, and uh, uh, with uh, the changing uh, commercial relations that we are witnessing, the European Union can keep, I say keep, not increase the influence without uh, putting some more efforts at supranational level and respectively inc increasing the budgetary instruments for that. Thanks very much. Now I'd like to give the floor to the panelists on the reverse order. And please, I'm saying that strictly in two minutes, otherwise I will not <laughs> Okay, I, I'll, uh, I'll give it a try, but then I count also my uh, fellow panelists to, to, to do what I, I may be missing. On, uh, on the duration, uh, I think uh, Alfredo has a point that, that there was a combination of conditions that could have allowed uh, for if to move from a seven to a five year, but uh, honestly, there wasn't much appetite uh, around the table for uh, very different, uh, uh, different reasons. The commission, when it Put out uh, the discussion, the uh, discussion paper for, uh, for before presenting the proposal. So it was open uh, also to, to to consider a five-year period. But all the feedback that was uh, collected, uh, member states and, and even in uh, in, in Parliament, uh, was uh, not revealing a, a very large. Uh, uh, appetite, uh, but, but I think the, the issue uh, remains uh, of uh, a possible alignment, knowing that uh, the alignment, once you take account the time for the preparing the proposal, negotiating, and uh, it, it is difficult to have a perfect match between uh, the five-year period of, uh, of the Commission and, uh, and the mandate of, of the Parliament with that, and so you always have some uh, overlap. But, but I think uh, it, it remains a, a pertinent uh, point. And maybe if uh, collectively we manage to make men less of a psychodrama to, to negotiate an MFF, that could be the, the way forward. On this, uh, on, say, compared to the, uh, to the initial proposal, where do we stand? I think there is a lot of progress in the sense that uh, the overall structure and design of the new MFF has uh, uh, gathered quite a lot of consensus on the broad structure that there is a, 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 a large uh, consensus and on the relative size of the, the, each element. Uh, indeed, this uh, is uh, part of the overall uh, discussion. There is indeed, as Ferdinand was saying, a, a number of uh, regulations that have already been agreed uh, between Parliament and Council and others for which the positions are developed. And from this point of view, there is more progress than in, in previous rounds, uh, and it helps uh, providing momentum for, uh, say, for moving uh, forward. Um, the, the, the state of the negotiation, uh, so the, 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 the presidency, the Finnish presidency has put on, on the table uh, um, a, a, say, a proposal to, to frame the quantitative and distribution uh, around which has not uh, uh, really gathered a lot of support. There, is, there are a little, large number of member states that do not recognize themselves in the way it is reported. The Commission does not 
think that that reflects uh, all the work and the negotiation that has been going on so, for, so far, and it does not consider as a good basis for uh, finding an agreement. So perhaps, but then maybe we need to go through this phase uh, to, uh, to enter into the trust uh, um, of, uh, of the negotiation. And it's clear that uh, it will have to move uh, into the package negotiation so that the different groupings uh, interests uh, that uh, may be uh, conflicting on specific uh, issues find uh, a, a, a possibility for an equilibrium. I think uh, with what is on the table now from the uh, Finnish presidency, I do not see how that could uh, allow to find uh, a a, a sufficient balance within the package, both on, on the expenditure and uh, on, uh, uh, on the revenue side of the budget. Um, the, the example of the... Uh, oh, so yes. <laughs> uh, then, just uh, maybe the, the last point on the uh, budgetary instrument for convergence uh, and competitiveness. Uh, um, it, it shows that, that if you leave it also only to the, the Ministry of, of Finance, it doesn't make uh, things uh, easier. And on the other hand, uh, that there is a, a, a term. A, 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 the bulk of a, an agreement with elements that have been agreed, <clears throat> and although not terribly ambitious, it could be, uh, say, give rise uh, to an embryo of something that could develop uh, uh, over time. I leave uh, the rest to the other panelists. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, well, I think Lord Silvanos took probably one minute, 45 seconds of my two minutes, uh, so, uh, but, uh, uh, but no, no hard feelings about it. So just maybe starting from the question which was directly to the Code of Auditors. The Code already um, has uh, uh, presented opinion on the, on, on the own resources uh, package uh, a good couple of months ago. Uh, well, we do not undertake the, the work that you would like us to, to do, I'm, 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 I'm sorry to say. So we, were, we, we, we haven't and, and probably we won't uh, look into this as it means, in the sense what it means to individual member states. Um, what we will do, however, it's, it will be much, much later on to look back what it has meant to, to individual member states. Uh, we do it every year in, the, in our annual audit when we look at the revenue. Uh, at the moment, there is so much discussion about the 1%, 1, 0, 0.55 of this, the Finn said, 1, 3, that's Parliament wants. So it's a one side of the one part of the of the of the multiplication. There is another part, the GNI. Uh, so to to what you apply effectively this uh, this percentage, which is equally interesting. The GNI verification cycle is, is a long process, seven years, uh, or normally done by Eurostat. So we we do look later on what it meant uh, for the member states in terms of contribution, but it will take some time. I I I, I have to uh, disappoint you. On a more on a more general note, uh, well, uh, it's been a very uh, very interesting discussion. I see, well, to, to my understanding, challenges come and go and they will always uh, exist. This time it's climate, there used to be more migration a couple of years ago and, and it's a very dynamic um, uh, and the world is, is evolving in, in such a pace that, that the challenges will come and, and go and, and, and new will replace the old one. So I will maybe repeat my, um, my, uh, my initial stand. I think the, 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 the fundamental issue is to, to reform the EU finance in such a way so that, so that a reaction to these challenges can be, can be quicker, bigger and better. Uh, which would be improved flexibility, which is there in, in the Commission's proposal, I admit, uh, probably could be, could be even better, define the EU added value so that the priority, priorities can be, can be easily set uh, and strengthen the performance and accountability framework. Uh, to my understanding, in any circumstances, this is a set of characteristics which uh, help the budgetary process to address any challenges uh, that, that come uh, and emerge in any given moment. Thank you. Three, three points. Firstly, on where the negotiations are. Uh, we won't know until next March whether they can be concluded in June or they have to go to October. So I think that's still, we simply don't know. And I think certainly some of the legislative proposals will have to be adjusted to the von der Leyen 
priority. So there will be changes over the next uh, over the next period. On just retour, I think it really is important that the EU begins to get some budgetary income flows that are not related to national to gross product. And apparently, of all that are there in the in the negotiations. The plastic bag tax has some chance and UTS has some chance and the rest have no chance at all. But I think anything that moves the revenue side of the budget would be good. And then finally on European public goods, uh, I think what we have to ask on European public goods, regardless of what we call it, is what are the things that Europe has got to respond to and what is the role of public finance in those? That's Thanks very much. That was great. Yes, two points because I, because I abused my time uh, in the introduction. Um, I'm grateful for the reference um, to the BICC uh, because um, it's a well-known zombie. It's a return of an idea uh, which was called the, the uh, Competitiveness and Convergence Instrument, which was rightly eliminated in 2013 because it's just a bad idea. It's a, it's a concept for people who cannot distinguish between the structural and the cyclical. And, uh, and uh, the, the, the fact that this is still being discussed shows that people are not really looking for the solutions to the real problems. If we would look for solutions to the real problems, we would discuss how to reinforce the macroeconomic imbalances procedure, for example, by taxing the current account surplus. That would be a real discussion, uh, which, and then a tool like that would also generate revenue for uh, the EU uh, budget. Uh, the other point, uh, connecting with uh, Bridget, that yes, we cannot predict uh, the outcome of the discussion if it goes like this. Uh, however, I think we have observed a kind of dynamic, and in my observation, the dynamic points towards a low ambition compromise. The low ambition compromise means that on the one hand, you have people like uh, Mr. Rutte, um, who would like to see a smaller or very limited budget in terms of volumes, on the other hand, you have the people like Orban and Babish, the crooks, uh, who would like to see uh, less conditions and less European policy. In other words, a renationalization. There is a match uh, between the two. So there is a possible compromise between the two. Rutte will be happy with uh, a smaller envelope. Uh, Orban and Babish will be very happy with the renationalization of the policy and less conditionality. So if we want to avoid this kind of low ambition uh, uh, compromise, we have to eliminate the time uh, 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 limit and use the available time, potentially even resetting uh, the whole discussion if that was uh, the wish or uh, the ambition of Ursula von der Leyen. Thanks very much. Uh, first of all, again, apologies for being so pressing on your time. But let me, if I may, uh, uh, conclude with a 20 seconds personal recollection. Uh, in my experience at the ECOFIN and Eurogroup, I actually attend, I think, between 45 and 50 of those, those meetings. Uh, I kept repeating a point uh, which was about the politics of public finance in Europe's own countries. And my point was simply, we are concerned about Eurosceptic sovereignist parties gaining political support, we might be seeing the time in which they are in government. Now, it so happened that my country has lived through a government of sovereignist uh, definition, and uh, I would not would like to share that experience with anybody because it's not been a pleasant uh, experience. So, but this is just to remind, and again, apologies for being so personal, that we should not underestimate uh, the challenges from that point of view that are still there. So when we talk about ambition, we talk about constraints, and we talk about convergence of preferences between a very orthodox economy and a very a more nationalist economy, I am even more concerned, because that could be a political alliance which could be very damaging to Europe. Apologies for being so direct, but this is part of sharing my thoughts with and my experience with you. Thank you again. Uh, again, so sorry.